Good morning. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to come here and visit with you today. Uh, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk with you um, a little bit about some of the research that is going on at Berkeley Lab, but also very much to talk with you about our vision for uh, what research is going to go be looking like in the coming years and to start a dialogue with you uh, about ways in which we can uh, interact with each other in the years ahead. Um, so uh, the topics that I will uh, discuss this morning will concern a little bit, since you are discussing the issues of the vision for what uh, the Research Foundation, Qatar Foundation will be looking like and science here will be looking like in 2030, I thought it would be interesting to start our discussion by trying to ask how will science itself broadly internationally evolve as we head towards the year 2030. And of course, that's always a very tricky business uh, because we tend to be uh, uh, influenced by what we see at the moment, but nonetheless, we try to project out to the future. And also, we have to ask, what extra demands will society have from science as we go forward? Society always has many needs from science, but as we look towards future decades, there will be even uh, stronger uh, needs that society will place on the world of science, and we need to try to organize ourselves in a way that is responsive uh, to those. So let me say uh, that as we think about science itself, we can imagine that we need to start from a foundation of the very fundamental sciences, such as uh, mathematics, physics, uh, chemistry, and biology. Those are, of course, the core disciplines from which everything else that we can do in science is ultimately built. And then, as we try to project out what things will look like in the coming decades, there are three new pillars that are being built today and which will be mature by 2030, probably. And uh, so the first one is the field of nanoscience, uh, in which we learn to control matter on very small length scales uh, in completely new ways. And I think we can predict with some pretty good um, confidence that uh, nanoscience will uh, lead us to have the ability to create highly advanced materials and highly intricate design systems. I'll try to give you an example of that uh, as we go forward. The second large mega trend, if you like, which is a pillar for science in the coming decades, will be, of course, the biological sciences themselves. If we step back and look at all of science today, all of uh, what we see in the world of science today, there is one area that stands out as kind of the central pillar uh, because it's changing so comprehensively, and that's the field of biology. Biology today uh, is entering an era where it was, is much more quantitative rather than qualitative. It's no longer a descriptive science. It's becoming a science in which there are hard laws that are helping us to organize and understand the information. And uh, it's becoming also potentially a tool for the creation of things, as opposed to an area in which we are more observational and trying to understand what's there. For example, we could imagine in the decades ahead that we might be um, using um, bacteria that are specially designed and modified in order to make uh, the chemicals which today are made using petroleum. And uh, that would be a major uh, development uh, that could emerge only as the field of biology continues to, to emerge. So nanoscience, biology, and the third pillar that I would call out would certainly be computation. Computation itself has increasingly become uh, stabilized as the important third leg of science, the ability to simulate things. But it appears to be entering a qualitatively new era in which actually almost any project in science cannot be completed without computation being a critical piece of it. And we see the field of computation itself dramatically changing by the de development of uh, the ability to collect massive data sets. Uh, at Berkeley Lab, uh, we are um, helping to maintain the uh, ESNet network that the Department of Energy runs in order to pass data sets around the world. And it is not uncommon today to have petabyte data sets traveling across the world, uh, and the handling of data of that scope and scale is a fascinating topic that is going to transform the ways in which science is performed. So we can see here nanoscience, the ability to purposefully cre create matter that is uh, highly designed, uh, biology, uh, the ability to uh, uh, understand and manipulate 
uh, the living world around us, and computation. Those three will be pillars of science in 2030 in important ways. And as we plan our future, we need to take that into account. Now, as I mentioned to you, we need to think, to what end will all of these things be occurring? And as we look at the world around us today, I think one thing that we can be quite confident is that there will be a major and increasing trend where science will be called upon to help deal with immense and large-scale problems of energy and environment. For sure, in 2030, there will be issues of health, there will be issues of uh, all, all the other issues that science addresses today will still be there. But the energy and environment issues are going to grow in their importance uh, in quite remarkable and important ways. And we can predict that from many factors that we'll be looking at momentarily. So what I see is uh, that this uh, foundation will support these pillars, but the pillars will increasingly be called upon to support uh, research that tackles problems in energy and environment. That's, that's the landscape that we see in the decades ahead. Now, how do we get there? Uh, I'd like to show you this iconic photograph of uh, the start of the national laboratory that I'm the director of. This is uh, E.O. Lawrence, who came to Berkeley uh, to start uh, his research career and soon afterwards invented the cyclotron. And when E.O. Lawrence invented the cyclotron, uh, he very quickly had a key insight which has had impact far beyond even his physics discoveries, which were, of course, quite remarkable. He had the insight that in order for him to realize the full potential of his discovery, he needed to work with many, many other scientists and create a team. And in many ways, I would say, it was probably the first example of true team science that developed in the world. So uh, one thing about his philosophy, uh, as you can see in this photo, he has all of his uh, early career colleagues here. A few of these here won Nobel Prizes uh, later. Uh, you can see here all of the staff who were supporting. You can see the incredible absence of diversity in that era. Uh, so all of those things are present uh, in these photographs. But one thing to remember about it is it shows the tension. It shows the tension between the uh, creative individual and the team. And that, of course, is what a lot of modern science is all about. Now, the lab that he founded did go on to grow substantially, and today it sits in the hills above the Berkeley campus in, 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 in a beautiful spot in Berkeley. And I would like to invite everybody here at one occasion or another. We would very much like to have you sometime come and see what Berkeley Laboratory is like, because it's a very special place. It has about 4,000 employees, a budget today of about $730 million a year, and many national facilities. And I want to emphasize that because in order to accomplish our research agenda today, scientists need to come together in teams and establish large-scale facilities which are far beyond the abilities of any individual researcher to ever create. And that is a key piece of what science looks like today. In fact, this ethos of strong individuals creating robust teams is the basis of a lot of modern science. And uh, it has worked well for Lawrence Berkeley Na National Lab. There have been 12 employees who have won uh, the, National, uh, the Nobel Prize. And about 3% of the United States National Academy of Sciences is on the staff uh, at this laboratory. And I really attribute the success of the lab over its many decades to having gotten right this formula for how to approach the topic of team building and individual creativity. Uh, one other mega trend, of course, which I think everyone here is quite well aware of, is the topic of globalization and the fact that there's really only one science, and science increasingly spills across all borders. There are many efforts to try to describe this, by the way. Uh, this shows a map uh, which was created by simply overlaying every time two authors publish a paper together, uh, drawing a line. And uh, so you can see some of the lines that have been drawn uh, for all of the cooperations that are occurring. And if you make a map of that as a function of the time, you can see that the lines across the continents are getting stronger and stronger as time goes on. Uh, this is a type of map which scientists are increasingly trying to create. Uh, this, for example, shows chemistry and physics is over here and some of the social science. This is an effort to try to make a map of all of the disciplines of science and how they connect with each other. And again, if you draw those as a function of the time, what you see is the increasing networking that is occurring. 
So we know that cutting edge science today requires teams that work across many scientific disciplines and international teams are now the norm. They're not exceptions anymore. They're becoming the norm for how science works. Global connectivity enhances cooperation and especially gives competitive advantage to those who embrace it. If you work with trying to create worldwide teams, you will be more successful in your science and have better opportunity. But of course, I emphasize again, part of that needs to be fostering creative individuals. And I want to also state that the way that that happens is not automatic, but happens through intensive personal mentorship that uh, can often occur globally across continents. And so this issue of global mentorship is really very front and center. And uh, one last point on this, society is more dependent upon science every day that passes. And yet, uh, large parts of the science, uh, 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 large parts of the population in the world are very remote from science. Some are even alienated from it and are distrustful of science. And that creates a very difficult stress situation for science and for society both. So uh, public science education is something every science institution has to embrace and work on uh, very hard. Okay, so now I'm going to go through briefly the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative. I think that you all know that if we look at the carbon cycle itself, uh, in, its, uh, in its state when there is not a lot of anthropogenic or human activity, uh, the carbon cycle consists of two different types of processes. Um, Short-term ones, which might involve, for example, the biosphere, which exchanges carbon uh, with the atmosphere very quickly. And the much longer term geological one in which we have volcanism creating uh, CO2 into the atmosphere when there's a volcano, which ultimately leads to um, sedimentation and uh, subduction and creation. That, that cycle, that ultimate geological cycle is the one that determines the long-term uh, carbon flux through the world. The biological cycle is very fast and uh, is actually typically in equilibrium. That's the state of, uh, of a natural uh, configuration. Today, of course, we're uh, in a, the first time, for the first time in human history, we've entered the stage where the actions of people are able to globally change the flux of energy, chemicals, and matter through the planet. And that's first manifested by this imbalance in the carbon cycle because of the fact that we take uh, fossil fuels and burn them on a massive scale, as well as changes in land use. The combination of those two have resulted in a situation where we have created an extra amount of carbon put into the atmosphere every year that's uh, uh, in, these, uh, in the number, uh, you know, eight and a half gigatons per year are the, are the anthropogenic carbon emissions, but about half of that remains in the atmosphere each year. And of course, that is something for us to really think deeply about. Uh, and if we think about what's happening today, uh, this is the total amount of uh, energy production per uh, year. If we, if we think about what's going to happen as the global population increases, we're going to need in the future uh, a few times at least by the year 2100, a few times at least more energy. And yet, if we are ever to bring the carbon cycle back into balance, we're going to need to make the carbon emissions at least three times smaller. So that means that we have almost a factor of 10 in how much we have to improve our um, ability to get energy per unit of carbon that we work with. That's a, a grand challenge for us over the coming decades. And it's one, uh, it, this is one of the great challenges that all of the disciplines of science will be trying to address in the coming decades. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. And it shows that we need to go from this um, open-ended, unbalanced carbon cycle to a future carbon cycle, carbon cycle 2.0, if you like, which is fully balanced. So at the lab, we have an overall program, which we call the Carbon Cycle 2.0 Initiative, which seeks to bring together all the scientists at Berkeley Lab, and it's probably over a 1,000 of them, who are working on one aspect or another uh, that relates to the problem of the carbon cycle. And this diagram is intended to show how all of those different science projects are connected to each other. What you see on it is this uh, uh, circle in the out outer region and then the central region. Uh, in the central region is energy analysis and climate modeling. And in this outer region here, you can see 
Uh, this is what I would call the arc of carbon. You can see here combustion, capture and sequestration, biofuels, artificial photosynthesis. This is how we use carbon today. This is what we will probably need to do in the short term. Biofuels will provide us some relief. And then ultimately, 30 and 40 years from now, we may well be doing artificial photosynthesis. So that's the future of carbon technology. On this side of the diagram, you see the off-ramps. Instead of using carbon, we stop using carbon through efficiency, uh, uh, increased use of solars for electricity, and uh, other forms of energy storage. And uh, the developing world I'll mention in a little bit. Now, on, uh, each one of these circles represents a significant research program at the laboratory. And in the center sits this group that does energy analysis whom we ask to go and talk to every one of these groups and provide a common economic uh, analysis and resource analysis and a scoping. How large can your research effort ultimately be to impact the future of the carbon cycle? And then finally, those energy analyses flow naturally into climate models which are being developed now and which operate on a regional basis to say, OK, if we deploy, for example, 60 million acres of solar in the Nevada desert, what impact will that have on regional climate when you turn the tan-colored desert to a black-colored uh, solar on the, that scale? So th there's many aspects of this that all come together in an integrated point of view. To illustrate that, I'm going to look at one example this morning, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And then I'm going to touch very briefly on artificial photosynthesis and developing world. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop. So let me just show you briefly the story of carbon capture and sequestration research at Berkeley Lab. It's one example that you can see the idea of this diagram in action. First of all, the problem, of course, I think you know, uh, we admit approximately 30 gigatons of CO2 per year. And it's very hard to understand what that number means. But here I show the top 100 commodity chemicals produced in the world. So these are all of the chemicals that are produced in vast quantities, such that you might transport them with giant trucks and cars and so on. And all 100 put together amount to half a gigaton, compared to the 30 gigatons of CO2. This gives you a feeling for how big this is. It's 60 times bigger than the top 100 chemicals all put together. So naturally, one, uh, this, this scale of the problem means that in the end, um, we will still be using carbon-based fuels in 2030, 2040, and 2050. There's no doubt about it, because we don't have the ability to transfer to any other technology on that time scale. That means that capture and sequestration is one of the possibilities that we have to very, very seriously evaluate. And unfortunately, the technology that we have today is a rather poor one. What you can do is capture CO2 from the flue gas from a power plant by bubbling it through a solution of water containing amines. The amines bind uh, the CO2 and pull it out. Now, you might say, why don't you just leave it there? Well, you can't because there's not enough amine in the world to capture all of the CO2. You can see the top 100 chemicals are only 1 60th of the amount of uh, CO2 that's produced. That means that to capture C CO2 effectively, you have to transfer it. You have to first capture it and then release it somewhere. And that somewhere has to be big enough to keep it. That's why you have to capture it and then put it underground, almost certainly. And um, the current amine process is very energy intensive because at the end, that CO2 binding is quite strong. But to release the CO2, which is a necessary step, you have to boil the water, which of course consumes a tremendous amount of energy. So approximately 25% of the power of the power plant is required simply to uh, capture and then release the CO2, which is an unacceptable amount of extra energy and far from the thermodynamic limit of what could be achieved. Therefore, we turn to our scientists at the lab and at the world at large and ask, isn't it possible for us to create a better way of capturing the CO2? So uh, this is where advanced uh, materials discovery becomes very important. Uh, today, uh, Omar Yagi is here in the audience. He's the discoverer or developer of the class of new compounds called metal organic frameworks in which inorganic and organic species are combined in intricate new ways. And here you can see a picture of a so-called metal organic framework. It's a, I think this is a very beautiful picture 
of the intricate structure that has been created recently, which is essentially a solid state version, a highly porous material that presents amine functionalities that can bind the CO2 in very selective ways. But now it's solid state, there's no water. When you capture the CO2, you can warm it up gently and release the CO2. This is made out of elements which are abundant and which can be readily used to bind the CO2. So it looks like there's a real possibility. Uh, it's still early research. Uh, this is some work from my colleague Jeff Long at, at the Berkeley lab who has shown some remarkable characteristics for this particular metal organic framework, uh, which in fact does use approximately one-third of the energy of the current um, amine-based solution. So that's a big breakthrough, and uh, I think we're going to see many others like it. I want to point out to you that this, this breakthrough does not come from a vacuum. It comes from many years of studying the fundamental chemistry and material science and even physics of this class of material. And now that material can be designed in order to be used for this important societal application. Likewise, uh, we can see that uh, systematic control of these materials allows us to create many other very beautiful symmetries and arrangements. And here from some other work that Jeff has done recently, you can see another metal organic framework which is being used to separate a mixture of alkanes, which as you know, in the petroleum industry is a very key thing to be able to do and quite difficult to do. Again, here we've got a, a system which has been designed that has the ability to do this in very selective and interesting ways and um, it gets, saves energy quite a bit. And there's only one example of how the creation of new materials will enable a wide range of new energy technologies. Once the carbon is captured, it has to be sequestered. And uh, in order to do that, we need to understand the risks. People are fearful that if we take CO2 and put it underground into a reservoir, that the CO2 could escape again. So we need to have monitoring of the outside of the reservoir. We need to make sure that the seal is robust. But most importantly, we need to really understand at a very deep level what happens when you stick CO2 underground and it mixes in with water. What is the phase diagram? How does it mix? What's the nature of the reaction of CO2 that's in this complex fluid as it reacts with mineral surfaces? These are deep questions that involve physics, chemistry, and uh, geology mixing together disciplines in a very interesting way. Uh, so the challenge here, of course, is to simulate on the computer the long-term fate of carbon dioxide injected underground on length scales that vary from nanometers to kilometers. This is a terrifically challenging problem that uh, faces uh, our, our science today. Here you can see some recent simulations from, from the laboratory. On the one scale here you see at the nanometer scale, this is a tiny pore in the computer. This is a quartz uh, tube, if you like, in which uh, the computer we have water and CO2, and we can study the nature of the interaction between those two as well as any reactions with the interface that might occur. This generates kind of microscopic scale information, which then is tried, we try to verify by specific experiments that study the surface interactions at a, in the laboratory. But then this data informs ultimately what goes into a set of simulations. Here you can see simulations of uh, CO2 being injected into 20 wells in an area called the Mount Simon Formation in Illinois. This is an area where there are a lot of power plants that generate CO2, and nearby there's an excellent geological formation for storing the CO2. So on the computer, they have in injected CO2 into 20 locations over a period of 50 years on the computer. They've injected five gigatons of CO2, so it's a, it's a noticeable amount. And then they've simulated it for 200 years after that. And they find that in this case, for example, the CO2 does not spread from one site to another over that time scale. But it does, as time goes on, burrow down deeper and deeper into the, uh, into the uh, region. And they find that the pressure goes up quite a bit, as high as 30 bar. And that's because there's briny water in this formation. And when you push the CO2 in there, it just basically raises the pressure a lot. 
This is now where our project takes an interesting turn because we've gone from creating a capture material to doing the simulation experiments, and now we turn to our energy analysis group at the laboratory. These are economists, a few social scientists, and others, and we ask them, what do you think about all this that we're looking? Take a look at the science, and what do you see? And they turn around immediately and say, you know what, um, all that extra pressure that you made inside there actually could be used simply to push the brine out of those pores and create briny water. If we create the briny water and uh, we can separate the water itself and collect it and also collect the salt. And the salt, for example, from this Mount Simon formation could then be sold in the Midwest for road salt to help melt the snow when it's snowing. So there's an economic use for it. And then they calculate that out. They find that they, can, uh, they could probably get approximately $17 per ton of CO2. Compared to the $80 per ton of CO2 for the capture, that's a significant number. So it shows that there's probably an integrated way of making this technology be um, uh, used in, in, in many interesting ways. In fact, if they do a complete life cycle analysis, you can capture a great deal of value from the brine in the water. CO2 from a one gigawatt coal-fired power plant could displace 20 million meters cubed of brine per year. And it turns out that if you uh, act on it by doing some geothermal cycles with the CO2, use the CO2 as a working fluid for geothermal, but also push out some of the briny water, uh, do reverse osmosis, you can ultimately collect the salt and when all is said and done, you can uh, reduce the costs of carbon capture by up to 30 percent by, uh, by this collective uh, complete life cycle use. And in the meantime, you get 50 gallons of reclaimed water per ton of CO2. So and indeed, the CO2 problem can be connected back in with the water in this interesting way. This is an illustration of the idea behind this diagram. But imagine that taking place for every one of these topics, biofuels, solar PV, and so on, in which we try to think in an integrated way how to make materials, how to understand their fundamental physics and chemistry, material science, but also their energy analysis and how to connect them into a climate model. That's a vision for what a national laboratory that is integrated in its approach is capable of doing. Just quickly, two more topics that I will show on here, which I think are very special for this audience to think about a little bit. One is artificial photosynthesis. I mentioned to you a moment ago that our view is that in the future, one day, we will be doing artificial photosynthesis as a means of making our fuel. The idea, of course, is to take, make fuel from sunlight. Instead of making electricity by shining light on a solar cell, we could directly make fuel, which is, of course, what nature does all the time. This is a grand challenge for science. If we look at how nature does it and we look at the photosynthetic membrane, it is an intricate, complex system of exquisite beauty, actually. And the question becomes, can we make an artificial membrane which takes CO2 and water, these are the bottom of the energy hill, and uses the photons, the energy of the photons, to take them back uphill towards a fuel. If we could do that in an efficient and scalable way, then we could take the CO2 and water, combine them with the sun, make a fuel, and when we burn the fuel and make CO2 and water, we will have a complete cycle instead of a half of a cycle. That would fulfill our dream of having a stable carbon cycle in the future. We have recently worked very closely with our colleagues at Caltech as well as four other universities in California uh, to, uh, we were successful in winning a competition for a, a so-called Department of Energy Energy Innovation Hub, uh, which is a new project that's just starting up called the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. The goal is to make an artificial leaf which could solve the problem of solar energy storage by having at least 10 times the power efficiency of a biological photosynthetic system so that it would use much less area but would be scalable and manufacturable. Um, this will require deep aspects of nanoscience, the ability to build materials on the nanoscale because that's how nature solves the problem, the ability to control quantum behavior and to measure at the level of single molecules. There's a very deep fundamental science in this. At this moment, the group has just started to form and uh, they have a target to make a first prototype by the spring. So they have some designs on the board now. The first prototype 
will actually split water. It won't combine CO2 and water because the catalysts are not yet mature enough. But there are designs being developed in which there's really now a new kind of solar cell that has a feed-in of water and a separation of two gases, oxygen and hydrogen, that would be collected out the other end. So uh, stay tuned, and in the spring, hopefully, you'll be seeing the first prototypes of this uh, structure. The last, very last topic is uh, beyond artificial photosynthesis is developing world. And I just want to show you something on here that I think is extremely, um, extremely important. And um, there it is. OK. This shows the, um, I'll play it a couple of times. This shows the CO2 emissions and the income per person. Emissions per person, income per person as a function of the year. And uh, what you can see by looking at this diagram, this if I can play it again, hopefully. Uh, maybe. Yep, yeah, there it goes. There's the Great Depression. Did you see that? It went back. Uh, the, but the, the size of the circle represents the population for each country. And, and the point that I want to make to you, of course, you can see that the United States has a fairly large population and really uses a lot of CO2 per person. And uh, here you can see that there are other countries that have incomes per person that are very similar to the United States, but use a fraction of the CO2, of the, of the carbon per person. That's something that we know about today. And of course, that shows that it's possible. Now, what you see down here, if you start someplace right about here, this is China and India, giant populations, and then all these other circles here, all the, just start from this point and go down from right about there and come down. Those are people who live on $2 or less a day. There's uh, more than 2 billion of them in the world. Those people have an intense desire to have access to a better life for themselves and especially for their children, for their families, for their grandchildren. Their dream is that they would have a better life. And they will fight like crazy to do it, and they will succeed, and we will all help them. And what does that mean? That means that all these circles here, the area of those, are going to be someplace over here in terms of income in the coming decades. And the question is, will their energy use per person be up here, or will it be on a curve like this down here? And the difference between those two is all the difference in the world for what the future of the environment of our planet will look like. What this means is that whatever we may think about advanced technologies for the developed world, in the end, what happens in the developing world is what's going to determine the future of the environment for our planet. And therefore, all institutions that perform science in the world will need to work on this problem together to solve it so that people who today are dragging themselves up will have a good life without blowing out the carbon balance. At Berkeley Lab, there are a number of projects that people have been engaged in. For example, this shows Ashok Gadgel's uh, UV water purifier, which can be used uh, to purify water in the uh, most poor regions of the world at an extremely low energy use and a very low cost as well. So I hope it gives you a feeling for the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative, and it emphasizes to you why this developing world topic sits right close to the center of it uh, in a very key location. If you're interested in the Carbon Cycle 2 initiative, please, there's a whole, uh, every one of those circles has a whole topic around it, and it's available on the LBL website, carboncycle2.lbl.gov. My last comment, uh, we, I've come here today uh, with many friends and colleagues hoping that Qatar will become itself a hub of the global science scene in 2030. And uh, we see here an open and international outlook. Qatar itself has uh, become a global hub for uh, the largest producer of natural gas, tremendous impact in worldwide communications, a terrific transportation activity. Will it also become a science hub? Uh, we certainly hope so. Uh, when I visited um, Education City a little bit over a year ago, I was just amazed to see the plans and some of the beautiful uh, structures which are being created. It, it seems to have the promise of being a very, very special place. And um, I just uh, would like to say that the whole world 
is watching to see how this develops and is ready to help you as part of this global network of science. Everybody would like to watch you as you experiment with partnership models in order to see how that can happen. And please don't forget to promote teams while fostering individuals because those are two of the key ingredients for performing uh, great science. And thank you for your attention.